I uh, just want to thank you to, for coming to hear uh, Jeffrey Hunt, and he'll be introduced. Uh, he'll speak about leak and leakers in the law. Um, tomorrow is our, our big day as well. Uh, in the evening, we have Frank Lamont defending speech you hate. That should uh, bring up some good discussion. And then there's at noon, the feast on the first or a little before noon, we'll be planting a liberty tree. But tomorrow morning is the most important uh, part of uh, First Amendment Day, and that is the march from City Hall to campus. So before I came up to introduce this, I wanted to find out how many people in the audience, raise your hand, have actually participated in a protest march. Look at this. You get this, David? There's, I would say, one quarter of it. When I was your age, and the, many of your students, in the midst of the Vietnam War, we protested that war, and it was on college campuses everywhere. I was at St. Peter's College in Jersey City, New Jersey, and we were enjoying the First Amendment right to... Uh, to march and protest and peaceably assemble when we saw the 7th Precinct marching seven abreast up Montgomery Boulevard with clubs. That will make you really appreciate the importance of marches. How many people here have participated in a march where they had to confront authorities? Look at this. That's pretty significant, David. Dr. Bula, pretty significant. Almost a dozen. Now let me ask one more question before I turn it over to my colleague and, and, and friend, Dick Doak, who will introduce our, our speaker. How many people believe that you could protest the way these 12 just protested in the wake of authority on a regular basis in any country whatsoever in the world? Look, nobody's hands, nobody's hands raised up. And aren't we... Uh, Americans or citizens of North America, very special in that we, we don't really care when we know we're right what happens to us. We march because of that beautiful First Amendment. So as you go through today, think about the times in your life where you felt so deeply about something that you marched in affirmation but the bigger trick is to march in protest with authorities coming at you. Many people in this room have. And with that, I turn it over to my colleague, Schwartz Award winner, 42-year veteran of the Des Moines Register, Dick Doak. Thank you, Michael. One more brief commercial announcement. Um, there is a petition, I'm told, at the back of the room uh, to, uh, the petition is to abolish the free speech zones on campus, the theory being free speech shouldn't be just in designated zones. It ought to be everywhere on campus. Um, if you uh, choose to do so, you can exercise one of your five First Amendment rights by, uh, by signing that petition at the back of the room. Um, and one more commercial announcement. Uh, First Amendment Day t-shirts on sale, also at the back table. Only $5, you can't find a bargain like that in t-shirts practically anywhere these days. Um, so tomorrow is First Amendment Day on the Iowa State University campus. Um, it's our annual occasion for celebrating and pondering the meaning of the five freedoms that are enshrined in the First Amendment. Um, in connection with that, um, I can't think of a better speaker to kick off that observance than the man I have the pleasure of introducing tonight. <clears throat> uh, and it's a double pleasure because he is a graduate of Iowa State University and a former editor-in-chief of the Iowa State Daily. <clears throat> uh, Jeffrey Hunt is a recognized authority on the First Amendment, on First Amendment law, and a veteran fighter for First Amendment rights 
and for openness and government. Um, after graduating from Iowa State, um, Jeff worked as a copy editor at the Des Moines Register, then moved on to, as a reporter to the Quad City Times and the Deseret News in Utah. And while there, he obtained his uh, law degree from the University of Utah in 1990 and is now with the firm of Parr, Brown, G, and Loveless in Salt Lake. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Utah uh, College of Law, and he's a regular guest lecturer on media law at uh, several other universities. <clears throat> he's the founder of the Utah Freedom of Information Hotline, and he recently spearheaded a, a, a protest effort uh, to restore the open records law in Utah, which had been suddenly and surprisingly repealed or, or se severely weakened by the Utah legislature. Uh, and uh, they succeeded in overturning that repeal, right? Uh, um, He's received numerous recognitions as, as one of the nation's top lawyers uh, in First Amendment and media law, and, and a number of awards for service both to journalism and to freedom of information. Jeffrey Hunter. This is close enough. I'll answer to anything. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be back at uh, Iowa State. Um, it's been 28 years since I left Hamilton Hall and embarked on a career uh, in newspapering and then later in First Amendment and media law. And time has a way of lending perspective. And from my vantage point, 28 years later, what I feel right now is a sense of immense gratitude and good fortune that I graduated from this university and particularly from uh, this school of journalism. I was fortunate to have been taught by some of the giants in the field, uh, names like Coonerth, uh, Disney, Wexler, Emerson, Blenn, and other distinguished faculty from the school of journalism. I owe a debt of gratitude to these outstanding teachers, scholars, and writers, and not just because they cut me slack when I missed class. <laughs> these were exceptional teachers, and they taught me how to think, write, and communicate clearly and concisely, how to push past the superficial answer, to be curious and inquisitive in work and in play, to not be afraid to fail and to fight for in ideas and principles that are important, like the First Amendment. In my judgment, this outstanding faculty that I was a beneficiary of really laid the, the foundation for the standard of excellence in teaching and scholarship that the Greenlee School enjoys today under the leadership of Michael and Dick and the rest of your distinguished faculty. So I just wanted to tip my hat uh, to uh, the, the, the people that laid the foundation and the people that are continuing the excellence today at, at the School of Journalism. Very proud to be part of that tradition. Dick alluded to a little scrap we had in Utah uh, last three weeks. The, uh, the legislature uh, every year would try to tinker with our open record statute, and it, always in a way that made it less open always adding an exception, uh, making it a little more expensive to get access to records. And 20 years ago, I was part of the working group of media representatives, public uh, representatives, government representatives that drafted uh, our open records statute. So I, I have a proprietary interest in it. It feels very special to me. I think that 
uh, open record statutes. I know Iowa has a very good one. Uh, are are one of those foundational uh, laws that really govern the relationship between the people and the government. It's not like an ordinary law. It's more like a constitution. It has found foundational principles that are essential to self-government. So it makes it special. And so when the Utah legislature slammed through this bill uh, within 72 hours, they unveiled it, and 72 hours later it had gone through both houses of uh, the legislature and signed by the governor. And they asked the Senate president, what was the rush? You know, what, why did you do it so fast? And he essentially said, because we knew that if we took a, took a longer time, that the media would prevent us from passing it. It was just extraordinary admission. They, they knew that the bill was bad, and they knew that it would not, would not be subject to scrutiny. So if it came out early, people would recognize it for what a bad idea it was, and they would defeat it. So they did a cram down uh, with, in 72 hours, and they passed this thing. And I just uh, had, had gotten back from an overseas trip and was thrown into the fire of trying to figure out what to do with this thing. We started a referendum effort to repeal the law. Uh, Utah, uh, the lawmaking power is shared between the legislature and the people. The people have the ability to make law and to repeal law. It's an arduous process because the legislature doesn't like to share that, that power. So they make it difficult, but it can be done. So we started that process of obtaining the necessary signatures and each of the counties to repeal the law. And then we started a massive public information grassroots citizen campaign to let people know what the legislature had done. And the, the amazing thing and the thing that was so gratifying to me was to see the response from the public. I'd always felt that the public uh, felt the way I did about uh, our open records law, but I would never really saw it until we had a five alarm fire and the people just were amazing. Uh, the, the, there were protest marches, the, the, there were sit-ins, there was, there was mass campaigns to the governor. And as a result of all that, the legislature did something that it has not done in a very, very long time. They, the governor was forced to call a special session of the legislature to repeal that bill. Uh, so it was a huge, huge win. And I, I talked to the to some of the legislators, some of the senators that, you know, are, are, are decent people and know better, and they basically told me that the legislature thought this would be a 72-hour media firestorm and then the media would go on, the people would go on, and they, they just totally miscalculated uh, the public reaction. They made the mistake of thinking that the open record statute was a media uh, law and it's not a media law. And it's a it's a law that protects the people's right to know, like the First Amendment. So uh, that is just a little story of a success story. Uh, you know, after 20 years of going up there year after year and fighting those battles, it's nice to have a story like that. And I think as a result of the the way we've got the people so energized in Utah, we're going to leverage this opportunity to make our law even better. Uh, than it was instead of weaker as the legislature wanted to do. So uh, enough about Utah. I've been asked to say a few words about leaks, leakers, and the law. And I'm going to try to do that uh, in the next 30 minutes or so. Leaks are as old as journalism itself. As long as there have been people gathering and reporting the news, there have been people willing to leak it to them. Uh, big tobacco secrets were leaked by Brown and Williamson executive Jeffrey Wigan, uh, who was later dramatized in the big screen uh, blockbuster movie The Insider. Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times, culminating in the landmark United States Supreme Court case, New York Times versus United States, which established that prior restraints on publication are presumptively invalid under the First Amendment. A disillusioned Army private named Bradley Manning is accused of leaking hundreds of thousands of classified military and diplomatic dispatches 
concerning the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to WikiLeaks. And of course, the most famous leaker in journalism, Deep Throat, uh, later revealed as FBI agent Mark Felt, connected the Watergate dots for Woodward and Bernstein. As these examples illustrate, information of significant public interest has come to light only because people inside government and inside corporate America were willing to take great risks to talk to journalists who in turn reported that information to the public. But how you feel about leaks and leakers depends very much on what information they are leaking and why they are leaking it. One person's courageous whistleblower can be another person's criminal and unethical leaker. Take the classic example of uh, former CIA operations officer Valerie Plain. Her name was leaked to the press in an attempt to discredit her husband, Joseph Wilson, who had accused the Bush, Bush administration of manipulating the intelligence to make the case for invading Iraq. The leak effectively ended her career in the CIA. This leak was widely viewed as crim a criminal act, and the leaker is someone who should be caught and punished. In fact, that leak did lead to a criminal investigation in which several famous journalists were subpoenaed to provide grand jury testimony and documents. Many of those journalists refused to testify because they had promised confidentiality to their sources. They contested those subpoenas in court. By and large, they lost. And one of the reasons they lost, I submit, is that the court, in weighing the, the interests uh, for and against compelling the journalists to testify, regarded this particular leak and this particular leaker as unworthy of legal protection. So that's an example where the bad motive of the leaker and the fact that the information leaked, in this case, the name of an undercover CIA operative, had no public value. It was outweighed by the societal interest, uh, outweighed the societal interest, rather, in protecting confidential news, news sources. A similar scenario to that is playing out right now in my home state of Utah. In this case, the issue is not national security, but rather illegal immigration. In Utah, as in many states, and I don't know what it's like in Iowa, immigration is a hotly uh, debated issue. Passions run very high on all sides of, of the debate. Several months ago, in a, in a misguided attempt to influence that debate, Someone inside Utah state government emailed to the Utah news media and law enforcement throughout uh, the state of Utah a list of 1,300 individuals who the leaker claimed were living in Utah illegally. The list, as it became known, included Social Security numbers, addresses, birth dates, and even the due dates for pregnant women. It's an egregious violation of, of privacy. It soon became apparent that the list had been compiled from a state database of persons who had sought public health assistance or other public assistance. All of the information that was contained in the list, the 1,300 names and all the identifying information, was private under Utah's open records statute. And under Utah law, it was a crime to disclose that information uh, intentionally. Many, uh, the reporters started checking the names out on the list, and they found some interesting things, one of which was many of the individuals on the list were, in fact, living in Utah illegally, or, I'm sorry, legally. The, the person had got the wrong names on the list. Now, they'd gone through there, and they'd seen that there was a Hispanic name, so they put them on the list, assuming that they were illegal. Uh, many of the undocumented individuals that were on the list were afraid to access health care uh, or other public assistance for themselves or for their children uh, for fear that they would be deported if, if they did so. A criminal investigation into uh, the person that compiled and disseminated the list is ongoing. And so I would just ask, are, are the state workers who released the Utah immigration list criminals 
who should be punished, or are they whistleblowers? In Utah, the overwhelming reaction has been the condemnation of, of this act, regardless of, this, of which side you are in the immigration debate. People realize that this crosses the line and that the means don't, don't justify the ends. So there are good leaks, Pentagon Papers, uh, the big tobacco, and there are bad leaks, the Utah case, Valerie Plain. And we can usually tell the difference between the two. But what about leaks that are a bit of both? What about leaks that have significant public value but may also place lives at risk? Should those leakers be investigated and prosecuted? What about news organizations that publish such material? Should they be prevented from publishing if harm may follow? And if they do publish, should they be subject to criminal sanction? What ethical, journalistic, and legal issues do these types of leaks raise? Which leads us to WikiLeaks. A few months ago, Bill Keller, executive editor of the New York Times, wrote a fascinating essay for the New York Times Sunday Magazine that detailed his newspaper's dealings with Julian Assange. And I don't know how many of you, if anybody saw that, that essay, but it was very well done. Julian Assange is the, the controversial founder of, of WikiLeaks, and he was in the possession of hundreds of thousands of classified military dispatches from the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. Those uh, dealings with Assange between the New York Times and Assange eventually led to the publication of a series of stories in the New York Times, The Guardian, and Der Spiegel magazine based upon the classified government records that Assange had obtained, as well as a separate batch of classified diplomatic cables between the U.S. State Department and embassies around the world. Critics have, have argued that no real news came out of the WikiLeaks documents, that nearly all the information had been previously reported, uh, and that the Times gave undue attention uh, to the documents simply because they were leaked and the Times owned the U.S. monopoly on, on the leak. Others, including the Times, have argued that the dispatches shed valuable light on the conduct of these wars, including in particular the role of Pakistani intelligence service in Iran, playing both sides of the fence with uh, the U.S. and with the Taliban. The New York Times would also argue that the military dispatches provided a raw, unvarnished look at the battlefield from the perspective of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that are doing the actual fighting in the wars. And that pre prevent, presenting this unfiltered look uh, at the war provides valuable uh, perspective and, and information to the public. I will leave the debate about the journalistic value of the material to Dick and Michael and the other journalism professors and, uh, and to you uh, students who are far more qualified than I am to, to assess the, the journalistic merit. But as a media lawyer, what, what interests me about the WikiLeaks case is, are the ethical and legal issues that, that it raises. And I'd like to briefly explore three categories or buckets, if you will, of issues that I think come out of, of that case. First, what was the relationship between the Times and WikiLeaks? Did WikiLeaks impose any conditions upon the Times regarding release of the information that were unethical? Did Wiki, WikiLeaks and Assange use the Times and other leak recipients for their own political purposes. Second, what ethical and legal responsibilities did the Times have to minimize the harm that might result from publication of classified military and diplomatic records? What did the Times do to minimize that harm? And who should make those kinds of decisions? And finally, 
Why didn't the United States government seek an injunction to prevent the Times from publishing the WikiLeaks documents? They knew about them ahead of time. They consulted uh, the government and told them what they had and what they were going to do. Could WikiLeaks be criminally prosecuted for providing the documents to the Times? Could the Times be prosecuted for publishing them? So let's pick these apart. Let's start with the relationship with Assange. With respect to the first issue, it seems clear that the Times treated Assange as a source and not as a partner or a collaborator in the publication effort. Assange provided the classified data on the condition that the Times, the Guardian, and Der Spiegel would not write about it before the specific date that WikiLeaks said it would post the material on its own website. Essentially, Assange requested, and the Times and the other news organizations agreed, to a publication embargo. And as Keller points out in his uh, essay in the New York Times, such publication embargoes are commonplace uh, in journalism. You have it with the prestigious military, or I'm sorry, uh, medical journals that will have articles that they're going to publish. They'll provide them to the journalists to digest and write about, but put a, a publication embargo on on, on the publication date. They are admittedly a constraint, but one that, that comes with some benefits. Uh, the main one being that it gives news, news organizations the opportunity to digest uh, all the material, to verify it, and to put it in context before presenting it to the public. Uh, and, and in this case, because of the, the voluminous amount of data that WikiLeaks had, uh, regarding the, the Iraq uh, and Afghanistan war dispatches and the diplomatic cables. It was very, very essential that the Times and the other publications have that time, and they used it so they could convert this raw data uh, into journalism that would uh, be informative to the public. So, according to, to Keller, the only, uh, the only condition that WikiLeaks imposed was the publication embargo. WikiLeaks had no say in what was written or published about the, uh, about the material. The Times paid no money to WikiLeaks. It signed no written agreements with WikiLeaks, and it made no promises to WikiLeaks other than to obey the publication embargo. But what about the question of manipulation? And this is something I see uh, in, the, in the press coverage of this issue. Did Assange use the Times for his own political agenda? Of course he did. <laughs> All sources have agendas. Uh, Assange is no different. Uh, sources leak information every day because they want to help themselves, they want to hurt someone else, they want to curry favor, any multitude of reasons, uh, some of which are noble and some of which are not. But just because a, a source like Assange has an agenda, or an ax to grind, or even a bad motive, uh, doesn't mean that you ignore the information. And I think that was, uh, I think, frankly, that's a big part of the problem with WikiLeaks. The public has a difficult time separating the un unsavory aspects of uh, Julian Assange's character with the value of the information that, that he gets his hands on. Um, but Assange is not unlike a lot of unsavory characters that journalists deal with, uh, eccentric and, ex and unsavory characters. And they deal with these people to get important information so that they can report that to the public. Assange just happens to have more information than most. Uh, so in, in dealing with Assange, I think the Times did what any reputable news organization would do. It did not make any promises or deals uh, that were improper. And it kept its eye on the most important thing, and that is the information. What was the information? Was it of value? Was it verifiable? What can we do to put it in context and report it to the public? And was there public interest in reporting that information? And the Times and the other news organizations concluded that there was public value. Minimizing harm, that's the second issue. The second bucket of issues for me 
And this one is far more troubling uh, and far more difficult. Uh, what responsibility did the Times have to minimize the harm that might result from publication of classified military dispatches during a time of war? And, and where and when and how do you draw that line? For the Times, the decision was made to withhold information that would put lives at risk. And that all sounds right to us. I mean, that sounds like the right call. But how do you implement that? I mean, what does that mean? How do you determine what information will put lives at risk and, and what information will not? For the Times, it meant bringing in reporters and editors with experience in handling military secrets who could make informed judgments about those types of things. Reporters and editors that had years of experience in handling classified material and had relationships with people in government that they could bounce scenarios off to determine whether harm would result or not. As a result of this process that the Times used in reviewing this material for minimizing harm, it redacted the names of Afghani citizens, local officials, activists, and others who had spoken to American soldiers, to Afghani soldiers, Iraqi soldiers, and diplomats, and whose identity, if disclosed, could cause those people to lose their lives or, or be imprisoned. The Times also edited uh, out details of intelligence gathering operations, military tactics, or locations of material that could be used to make terrorist weapons. One of the Times reporters, C.J. Chivers, is a former Marine. Uh, he brought a very special perspective to this task of redacting material that could cause harm. If a dispatch noted the times and locations that a certain U.S. warplane departed and arrived, Chivers redacted the information because it might teach enemy forces about the capability of the aircraft give you one example. I'm not a military or a national security expert, so I can't assess whether the Times made the correct judgments about these matters. I don't know whether it drew the line too closely or, or too loose. But what is important for me is that the newspaper recognized that it had a responsibility to not only assess this material for news value and what was in the public interest, but also a concurrent responsibility to minimize harm while it was doing so. And under that amendment right there, the First Amendment, these decisions are left to editors, not the government. And because they are left to editors, it's an enormous responsibility, particularly in a time of war. In this respect, the decision of what to publish and what to withhold from the classified Afghanistan and Iraq military dispatches was more problematic and difficult than the decision faced by the New York Times with the Pentagon Papers. Let me explain why. The Pentagon Papers, you may recall, was the secret Pentagon study that spanned the entire history of the U.S. involvement in Indochina from 1944 through 1968. It was a huge archive essentially a history of the war, the secret history of the war. And the central revelation in the Pentagon Papers was that the government was deliberately deceiving the American public about the conduct of the war and its prospects. It was saying one thing to the public, but inside they were saying another thing. The material covered a vast span of time, and it was primarily focused at the highest levels of government decision making. The president, uh, the secretaries of defense and state, the heads of the CIA, and the commanding generals. By the time Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times in 1971, it was years, uh, many years, and sometimes decades after the events documented in the papers had occurred and it was at a time when the war was winding down. Contrast that with the WikiLeaks situation. In WikiLeaks, you had classified military and diplomatic dispatches that were quite recent. 
uh, spanning from 2004 to the end of 2009. And they came from lower levels of government, from people who were doing the actual fighting, uh, people who were actually gathering the intelligence and sending in the field reports and assessments. So the immediacy uh, of the information and the fact that it was produced by the people who were actually doing the fighting made the task of assessing what information might jeopardize lives or national security much more challenging uh, and the responsibility for making those decisions much heavier. I think it's, it's also worth noting the contrast between how the Times uh, the Guardian and Der Spiegel handled the vetting of this material with what WikiLeaks did. Uh, WikiLeaks did not redact the names of the Afghans who were cooperating with the coalition forces, nor did it redact other information in the documents uh, that could risk lives. For the most part, it did, it did a data dump onto its website. In response to uh, what WikiLeaks did, there was enormous amount of criticism uh, in the media for putting lives at risk. And in response to that criticism, WikiLeaks has since made redactions to that material and exercised much greater caution in the subsequent uh, military and diplomatic dispatches that is posted on its website. There's been a, a good deal of debate about whether WikiLeaks, what WikiLeaks does is journalism or not. Um, I think that the very different way in which WikiLeaks handled the information and the way the other news organizations treated the information speaks uh, to that issue. And finally, what does the law say about all of this? Why didn't the Obama administration seek a court injunction prohibiting the Times from publishing classified material? And should WikiLeaks or the Times be criminally prosecuted for possessing or disseminating classified material? Let's uh, begin with the prior restraint issue first, because I think that's the easier one. The administration did not seek a court order restraining the New York Times from publishing because it knew it could not get one. That's the reason. And the reason that it could not get one is <laughs> right there right in front of us, the First Amendment. If there is any principle at the, at the core of the First Amendment's protection of freedom of the press, it's that the government cannot tell the press what it can and cannot publish. That is at the core. Prior restraints on publication are presumptively invalid under the First Amendment. The Although the, the United States Supreme Court has acknowledged the possibility that there may be a threat to national security so grave and imminent as to justify a prior restraint on publication, it is yet to find that case and to uphold a prior restraint. I think that is a powerful um, example of just how strong the First Amendment is. These are not easy decisions. Uh, when the New York Times discovered the domestic electronic eavesdropping program that the government was uh, running under the Bush administration. Uh, they called the publisher and the editor uh, of the New York Times to the White House, and George Bush basically told them, if you publish this information, you will have blood on your hands. People will die. And there was talk of getting a, a court injunction to stop that. They did not do that. The New York Times, I mean, if anything, people have criticized the New York Times for sitting on that information for too long. They knew about it for a year, and they were in a dialogue with the government for a year testing that harm, testing whether there really would be harm or not, and they reached the conclusion that there was enough information out there about this that there would not be harm, and they published it. That is a, a very, these, these, are, these are tough decisions to make. And they're not easy calls. And the fact that the First Amendment prohibits the government from restraining uh, the press in those situations is pretty remarkable. Um, that is the, the great legacy of the New York Times versus United States case, the Pentagon Papers case, 
where the court rejected the Nixon administration's attempt to enjoin publication of the Pentagon Papers. The tension between the newspaper's obligation to the public to inform and the government's responsibility to protect is as old as the nation itself. Justice Hugo Black, one of my heroes because he's a First Amendment absolutist, uh, he believed that the no law part there, where it says Congress shall make no law, that that actually meant no law uh, when it came to abridging freedom of the speech and freedom of press. So he did not allow for any exceptions uh, to the First Amendment. His view is not the law of the land. It was not accepted by the Supreme Court, but it's a powerful uh, expression of how, how he held that principle so dear. And his, in his concurring opinion in the Pentagon Papers case, Justice Black elo eloquently articulated his view of the balance between a free press and the government as follows, and I quote, in the First Amendment, the Founding Fathers gave the free press the protection it must have to fulfill its essential role in democracy. The press was to serve the governed, not the governors. The government's power to censor the press was abolished so that the press would remain forever free to censure the government. The press was protected so that it could bear the secrets of government and inform the people. Only a free and unrestrained press can effectively expose deception in government. And paramount among the responsibilities of a free press is the duty pr to prevent any part of the government from deceiving the people and sending them off to distant lands to die of foreign fevers and foreign shot and shell. These are powerful words then and just as powerful and relevant today. So. Although the Obama administration strongly condemned WikiLeaks for making the classified documents public, it did not seek an injunction against publication. Although the White House has challenged some of the conclusions and the reporting that has emerged from the documents, it has acknowledged the efforts made by the New York Times, Der Spiegel, and The Guardian, and other news organizations to vet the material, to withhold information that would jeopardize lives, and to give the government an opportunity to respond and comment. Which leaves us, finally, with the question of whether a crime was committed, and if so, by whom. Clearly, the government has a duty to protect its secrets. And those who are employed by the government and make a promise to keep those secrets have a legal duty to do so. Those who willfully violate that duty may be subject to criminal liability. That is what the prosecution of Army Private Bradley Manning is all about. Okay. He, was, he was the Army Private that made the promise not to disclose the secrets, allegedly, and disclose them. So he could have criminal liability. But I think one of the lessons of the WikiLeaks saga is that an Army Private should not have access to that much material. <laughs> There's hundreds of thousands, over almost a million military uh, dispatches, raw military dispatches from the Iraq and Afghanistan war and diplomatic cables. Uh, if, if it's that sensitive, you need to limit the amount of people that have exposure to it to the people that really need to have it. Otherwise, it's not a secret anymore. Um, that coupled with the the tendency of the national security apparatus to overclassify uh, information as secret or top secret um, made the WikiLeaks disclosures inevitable, in my, in my opinion. So can WikiLeaks be prosecuted? As we law lawyers like to say, it all depends. Um, if WikiLeaks actively solicited and participated and assisted in the unauthorized disclosure, then it could be criminal, criminally liable. We have no evidence that was the case. To me, the more interesting question is, does WikiLeaks' mere existence constitute solicitation? If solicitation is enough, active solicitation is enough to subject you to criminal liability, 
And the whole purpose of WikiLeaks is to serve as a conduit for persons who, to disclose information that they're lawfully not allowed to disclose, then is that solicitation? Is WikiLeaks like Napster, which initially operated a free peer-to-peer -peer computer file uh, sharing service that allowed people to download music for free? The courts eventually shut Napster down because it included that the primary purpose of Napster was to facilitate copyright infringement. So if a court concluded that WikiLeaks' primary purpose was to facilitate the unlawful disclosure of government or corporate documents, could a criminal prosecution be waged against WikiLeaks? And if it could, who would be next? Would, could they do the same thing with news organizations? I don't have the answers to these questions, but I think they're, they're interesting for, for you all to think about. Uh, which leads us finally to whether the New York Times or other news organizations could face criminal liability for publishing the WikiLeaks material. Although some have argued that the Espionage Act, which is a World War I era law, could be used to prosecute the Times, I would not bet on that happening. Aside from the technical difficulties of applying the Espionage Act to news organizations, there would be the little matter of the First Amendment. Criminalizing the publication of newsworthy information on matters of public interest has serious First Amendment implications. But the idea is not as far-fetched as, as it may seem. In fact, although Justice White voted with the majority in the Pentagon Papers case to uphold the right of the New York Times to publish, he wrote a lengthy concurring opinion in which he suggested he would have no problem sustaining a conviction of the newspaper for violating the Esp Espionage Act if it were proven that the Times published certain types of classified military information. So in Justice White's view, First Amendment prevents us from enjoining you, but you take the responsibility if you publish it, and you may be subject to criminal liability. In the end, I think that political judgments, much more so than legal ones, will argue against prosecutions of these sorts against the news media. Um, so where does this leave us? I think it leaves us with the tension that we've had uh, in, our, in our country since, since its founding, this tension between a free press that tries to ferret out secrets uh, and a government that tries to keep them. And I think that the Constitution uh, has created this contest. Uh, it's a contest that is vital to a healthy democracy. And I think the framers wisely understood that, that the First Amendment was necessary to protect the integrity of that contest between the government and the press, and that through the First Amendment, which, as I like to say to my legal colleagues, is first for a reason, uh, that, that we have a, a country that protects that, that dialogue and protects that ability to publish information. And I think it's, it's a very worthy amendment and worthy of the celebration that we have tonight and throughout the, the week in celebrating it. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Jeff Hunt. Uh, um, let's open it up to questions shortly. But first, we have a little presentation here. Thank you very much for uh, thank you for being with us this night, tonight. Thank you. Um, now we have time for some questions, discussion, if you wish. There's a microphone at the back. If you anyone uh, care to line up and. Uh, Fire away. And I would guess uh, Jeff would be willing to answer questions about yeah. any uh, any media law question, not not just uh, WikiLeaks. I don't have a question. Huh? <laughs> uh, this is a little off topic, but it's still a First Amendment question. Do you think that? Uh, giving money to political campaigns is freedom of speech. 
and I'm referring to the Citizens United case that uh, just recently. Yeah, well, the, the United States Supreme Court says it is, so it, it must be free speech. That one is a really, that is a tough one for me um, because I, I've seen what the huge amounts of money that have been poured into uh, politics, how it can really distort the process. And I think that this really conflicts civil libertarians, this issue of uh, money, uh, corporate money, and, and free speech. And it split the ACLU board almost right down the middle. The ACLU had a really hard time trying to come up with what position to take in the Citizen United case. Uh, so, you know, this, the First Amendment purist in me says that, uh, yes, that the Supreme Court got it right, but the good government side of me says that uh, I'm really worried about where this is going with the amount of money that's, that's flushing through the system and the distortions that creates in our democratic system. So that's a lawyer, lawyerly answer. I have it both ways, you know. Any other questions? Anything? We don't want to talk about. I don't feel I need to actually use a microphone. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> Uh, not so much his rank, it, just the number of people that had access to that, that material. I mean, it wasn't just that private or, or a lieutenant. There was an enormous amount of people that had access to information that the government had determined to be extremely sensitive, uh, top secret. And so it's, it's more not so much his rank, and you'd be much more qualified to speak to that than I would. It was more the notion that if the government is going to disseminate it's, it's most highly sensitive information that widely, then I think it is increasing exponentially the, the chances that that information is going to leak. Yes. Um, I, I think that if, 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 the, if the reporter or the news organization is participating um, or assisting uh, the leaker in getting the material, telling, directing the person the types of material that, that they want to obtain, if there's some active participation, then I think that under, under our criminal statutes, that's, that's probably sufficient to establish criminal liability. But I see that as different than being the passive recipient of the information where you had no involvement um, in getting it. You had no involvement in the decision to release it. Um, I think that's what newspapers are for, is to publish relevant information to the public. And sometimes it comes to them uh, illegally. It's, it's obtained or disclosed illegally. And that happens. It happens all the time, um, but we don't prosecute the, the newspaper for publishing it unless they, they participated in some illegal act. It's much like uh, the reporters I advise in my job, if they trespass, <laughs> to, you know, if they have the camera man, he doesn't have permission to be on the property and he's shooting video, he's subject to the trespass laws just like everybody else. He's committing... A, you know, a tort or sometimes even a criminal trespass in the act of gathering the news. And he's subject to the laws just like everybody else. So I think you need to make sure that you don't cross that line in the news gathering process.
Yeah, that's a really tough one uh, for me. That's that really raises some tough ethical issues and journalistic issues about you know whether calling more attention to someone like that puts more people at risk. And I think that that, to me, it's just important that editors struggle with that issue, that they decide, you know, that that is a balancing act, that they have to weigh the publication versus the harm that can result from the publication. And different editors will draw the line differently, and news directors draw that line differently. But the ones that I have trouble with are the ones that don't go through the process and, and think about balancing those two things. Uh, Yeah. And the downsizing of the news media has given us a culture right now where we don't hear about things, or we hear about things when it's too late to do anything about them. Investigative reporting costs money. Investigative reporting requires bureaus. USA Today has closed all its bureaus in the United States. The Washington Post has a Washington Post bureau. Um, right now, my mind's in another place, but paper in uh, Salt Lake hasn't followed up on the Marine and the first expeditionary force who um, said he was beheaded and then turned up um, in, um, in Lebanon, yeah. shipped back to the United States, right. and then went AWOL again. Uh, so why this tomorrow is important, and why the, the students and young journalists in this room should realize its importance is because without No, I, I, no, I, I think you raise a, a good point. Something that I've seen on the legal front is that news organizations have less money to wage legal battles. I mean, in the 20 years that I've been representing news organizations, we used to, a court, a judge would kick the media out. We'd be right in there with a motion to open the courtroom. Some uh, city council closing a me meeting illegally, they'd get the lawyers, they'd get right on it, and you just are not seeing that aggressiveness in enforcing the Sunshine Laws that I used to see. And, and, and frankly, I think what befell Utah with this open records uh, uh, fiasco was a symptom of that because they sensed that we were weak, that we had not been as aggressive and as strident and as protective as we had been. And they thought that, that uh, we would just roll over. And they were wrong about that. But, you know, I, I fear for who is going to pick up that mantle and, and fund these battles because it's, it's expensive. I've got kids I've got to put through college, you know. Someone's got to pay me to, to fight these battles. We do a lot pro bono. My firm runs a, a freedom of information hotline where anybody can call up in the state and get counseling on, on their rights of access. But there's only so much we can do pro bono. And frankly, I think one of the things that, that I saw the power of in this open records battle was social media. The fact that they were able to just go viral with the Twitter and, and the Facebook and, and mobilize the population in a way that I had not seen before, that maybe is a sort of a force multiplier for us uh, in fighting these battles down the road. They don't have, you know, last time I checked, though, Twitter didn't have a bureau in Afghanistan. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. There are limits. <laughs> Any other?
That's right. Yes, that's right. So corporate. Uh, in fact, the New York Times versus Sullivan was, uh, you know, it's a, it's a corporation. So uh, the corporations are, are incorporated by people and they act through people, but they have their own legal identity and they have First Amendment rights. I had a question about uh, um, because of the internet um, and the uh, ability for basically anybody to publish now, um, where when the Pentagon Papers came out, um, if the Times didn't publish it and didn't report on it, uh, would they have gotten into the mainstream? Whereas now we have WikiLeaks, because of the internet, WikiLeaks will put those up anyway and people can access them even if the media doesn't report on it. So my question is, because of the internet and the ability for everyone to publish, in the future will journalists even worry about uh, publishing uh, stories about documents or uh, video, videos of animal cruelty that were um, uh, acquired illegally uh, since they're already been published on a different site and uh, already already there in in the public forum will will the laws do you think the laws will change at all or affect yeah, that it's, differently? it's a really it's a really good point and uh, I think what the, what the internet has done is made it a lot easier to disseminate that type that type of information. So you've increased the the ability of leakers to get that information out to the public because they can just get it posted on a web. But what you don't get, and what I think is still vital, is what the New York Times did with the WikiLeaks material. You have to have someone do some journalism, someone that takes all that treasure trove of material, sifts through it finds out the stuff, separates the irrelevant from the relevant, the important from the unimportant, put it together in a coherent fashion, and report it to the public. And that's what just throwing the documents up like WikiLeaks just doesn't do. I mean, people aren't going to take the time to sort through all that stuff and figure out what's important and what's not. And that's what The Guardian, The Times, and Der Spiegel did that has, has value. Uh, hi, I'm my name is High Student, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on uh, the First Amendment being used as kind of like a pro for groups like the Westminster Baptist Church? Or is like, wasn't there a ruling that said yeah. that the Westminster Baptist Church could yeah. protest at military funerals yeah. and, and they use the First Amendment? We're going to talk about that tomorrow, but to me, that is the acid test of the First Amendment. I mean, the First Amendment does not, it's not there to protect the speech we all like. <laughs> you know, that speech doesn't need protecting from the First Amendment. The First Amendment there is there to protect the speech that we don't like, the speech that can be hateful, like that speech. And I, uh, last night, see, this Wednesday night, yeah, last night, I was, uh, Chief Justice uh, Roberts was visiting the law school at the U, where I'm an adjunct professor. And we were at a dinner, and someone asked him that question. Uh, it said, you know, what's the hardest part of the job? Don't you have cases that you decide where it really, really conflicts with your values? You don't want to rule that way. How do you deal with that? And he was kind of surprising. I mean, he's a pretty tough guy. He just said, it doesn't bother me at all. He said, I've been a lawyer for a long time and a judge for a long time. And it's just part of being a lawyer is that you advocate for clients that, you know, who you don't necessarily agree with, you don't share the same values. And with the law, you apply the law irrespective of your own personal uh, values and, and wishes. And he said that's what he did in the Westboro Baptist case. He said the principle was clear and it was important and it, it en encompasses that type of speech. Even though if you read that opinion, it is a horrible thing right. that those people do. And if the, you know, if the First Amendment protects that, I mean, I think that's – that shows you how muscular and how resilient a country we are that we can tolerate protecting that kind of speech. Let, let me also follow up real quick. Tomorrow at 445 in the Cardinal Room here in the Union, um, Jeff, along with Frank Lamonte, who's over here on the right, Gene Polizinski, who's just coming in from behind me. Frank's the head of the Student Press Law Center in, in Arlington, Virginia. And Gene's the head of the First Amendment Center in Nashville, Tennessee, and also Adam Kissel, who works for an organization called The Fire. 
They're going to have a roundtable discussion, which Dick Doak is going to lead. It should be wonderful, and it's entirely, if we can get Ames High School students to come back tomorrow, it's entirely about Snyder versus Phelps. So we'll get into it even more deeply then. Sorry to interrupt. So question in the front, ma'am, please. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it does on occasion do that, and that's why you need journalists to ferret out those, those lies. Yeah. Any other questions from the group? Okay. Thank Jeff, you very thank much. you so much for coming tonight.